recording is on. Welcome everyone. I see we have plenty of people coming into our Zoom webinar tonight. Good evening. We're expecting over 100 participants tonight. So thank you for joining us on this uh, lovely July evening. Lots of folks coming in right now. Great turnout. Hopefully everyone is okay. We had a tornado here in the Toronto area earlier this afternoon. Um, and some more thunder showers tonight. Hopefully we won't have those during our talk. I'll just go ahead and start in just a moment here. We're just letting everyone come into our webinar. Looks like we have about 50 participants so far watching this evening. Uh, we have folks registered from across the country and from the United States, which is a great turnout for us. Demerick is adding some comments into the chat section so you know a little bit about how questions and so forth are going to work tonight. So go ahead and check that out while we're waiting. Okay, looks like our participant list is, is filled up. So let's go ahead and get started this evening. So once again, everyone, good evening and welcome. My name is Alex Gates, and I am the executive director and curator of the Canadian Automotive Museum in Oshawa, Ontario. On behalf of everyone at the museum, I'm glad you're able to join us tonight as we share Canada's automotive heritage. We once again have more than 100 participants tonight joining us from across Canada and the United States. To begin with, let me cover a few technical details. We are using the Zoom webinar platform, so as a participant, you are able to see us and the presentation, but all of your cameras and sound are off. So sit back and relax this evening. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A and we'll answer as many as possible at the end of the talk. Demerick, our special projects coordinator, will be monitoring the Q&A throughout the evening. We also have Jamie Fielding joining us from the GM Oshawa assembly plant, who can help with any additional questions. If there's something we aren't able to get to, we can certainly follow up with you after the talk with the email address that you use to register. We will be recording this talk tonight and it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel next week and a link will be available in our August e-newsletter. Following this talk, you'll receive a survey on this event. This is the final talk of our 2020-2021 speaker series, so your feedback is greatly appreciated. Our 2021-2022 series will restart in September, and we're excited to have none other than Malcolm Bricklin himself joining us on September 16th. And we'll have more information on that coming soon. Finally, thank you to everyone who made a donation to the museum as part of your registration. There are a number of costs that we incur from Zoom and other software programs to run these events, so I really appreciate your support, particularly while we are currently closed to the public during COVID-19. After seven months, we are finally able to reopen tomorrow, and I look forward to seeing everyone once again at the museum. It's now my pleasure to introduce our featured speaker this evening. Chandra Prizar is Vice President, Sales, Service, and Marketing at GM Canada. Chandra was appointed to Vice President of GM Canada Sales, Service, and Marketing in September 2019, reporting to Scott Bell, GM Canada President and Managing Director. Prior to this role, Mizar was Director of Marketing for Chevrolet Trucks, where he led the brand's advertising and marketing efforts and the launches of several vehicles and special edition models. He held that position since March 2014. A graduate of Eastern, University, uh, Eastern Michigan University, uh, he joined GM in 1998. Now, I've also told he is a former DeLorean owner, uh, but currently his garage has a C8 Corvette and an Oshawa-built Cormero. Cam uh, sorry, Camaro. So uh, quite a Canadian car guy, quite a GM car guy, and I'm fascinated to hear his talk tonight. So with that, I will turn over the floor uh, to Shandor. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. It's uh, an honor and a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much, Alex. Uh, it's great to be here. Good evening, everyone. Uh, appreciate uh, your inviting me to be a part of the Canadian Automotive Museum for this Thursday talk. Uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to everyone virtually and stay tuned for some Q&A as well. So today I wanna share how GM is working towards our all electric future 
as well as an update on everything we've been doing in Oshawa. So I'm a huge car enthusiast. I'm an auto industry history buff. So I jumped at the chance to tour the museum uh, before the pandemic hit. Um, Scott Bell, our president and managing director for GM Canada, along with Greg Pratt, uh, the Oshawa plant manager, and I met with Alex, uh, our museum curator, and we got a great tour of this amazing museum, and we were able to sit in a vintage Chevrolet as well, which was very cool. So before we get into the, the present and future of General Motors, uh, just a quick touch upon our history. GM has operated in Canada for more than 100 years. And we're inspired by a true Canadian innovator, Colonel Sam McLaughlin, who had a simple mantra, one grade only and that the best. And we take that mantra to heart and look for opportunities to do the best for our customers, as well as the communities where we live and where we work. Our headquarters has always been in Oshawa, Ontario. It's about 45 minutes from Toronto for those of you who are not local. Colonel Sam McLaughlin was a great man and very well respected in the community. Uh, back in 1928, at the official opening of the new GM Auto Assembly Plant in Regina, uh, Chief Red Dog met with Sam, the president of GM Canada, and he was accepted into the tribe, signified with a headdress. Recently, Chief Michael Starr of the Star Blanket Cree Nation said that the headdress was a gift rarely presented, only given to leaders who had high qualities and were very, very wise. And certainly that describes Colonel Sam. The headdress has been in Ontario for decades, but recently made its way back home to Saskatchewan. And it's on display at the First Nations University of Canada in Regina. And you can read more about the long friendship between these two great leaders on CBC Saskatchewan. So as we know, uh, GM made the difficult decision to end production at Oshawa Assembly in 2018 with our previous generation of trucks, but we never gave up on Oshawa Assembly or the Durham region. And in 2019, we brought stamping and manufacturing operations back to Oshawa. And in 2020, to support Canada's needs during the pandemic, we launched a mask making room at Oshawa and we got it up and running in just three weeks. Today, we're excited that Oshawa is now ramping up for production of full-size trucks. Uh, I'll provide more details about that in just a few minutes. But before we talk more about Oshawa, I wanna highlight GM's commitment to electric vehicles. Led by Mary Barra, our chief and CEO, at General Motors, we believe the world is ready for the mass adoption of electric vehicles. By the end of 2025, GM will have launched 30 new EVs globally, and two thirds of those will be available in Canada. Ultimately, we believe the future of transportation is electric, autonomous, and connected. We see it as a future with zero crashes, zero emissions, and zero congestion. And we're committed to this vision because it's good for the company, it's good for our customers, and it's good for our planet. GM is positioned to lead this shift to EVs as we leverage decades of manufacturing experience, strong brand recognition, and industry-leading customer loyalty. By 2025, we will have invested more than $35 billion in electric and autonomous vehicle production as part of our commitment to put everyone in an EV. Unlike our main competitors, we're investing in our own battery manufacturing. We've announced two EV battery plants in partnership with LG Chem that will supply all the batteries for our EVs. And unlike EV startups, GM has over 100 years of manufacturing expertise. We know how to build quality vehicles and we know how to do so efficiently and at scale. The heart of our EV strategy is a modular, flexible platform that we call Ultium. It has the power to make almost any type of vehicle an electric vehicle, and it will be the basis for all of our EVs in the future. This platform is made up of groundbreaking battery architecture, electrical propulsion systems, and high energy battery cells. Ultium batteries are unique because they contain pouch cells that can be stacked either vertically or horizontally inside the battery pack. And GM will also be the first to use an almost completely wireless battery management system. 
So these innovations are gonna make it easy to optimize the battery size and layout for a variety of vehicle designs. What's more, Altium can be programmed over time with new software improving performance. So similar to what you do with your smartphones with updates today. We're confident the Altium platform will deliver industry leading torque and power density across a wide variety of EV models. And it will be easier to scale because it consolidates many parts and features, which plays a huge role in making EVs cost competitive versus internal combustion competitors. And it provides flexible vehicle options for a broad range of customers. For GM, our most significant carbon impact comes from the tailpipe emissions of the vehicles we sell. And that's why we're aspiring to eliminate tailpipe emissions from new vehicles by 2035. Because we lead sustainability at the enterprise level, that's going to ensure a broad approach across the company. Our commitment to sustainability goes beyond just the vehicles themselves uh, to include how we manufacture them to begin with. And we've also pledged to be carbon neutral in our operations by 2040. Our journey to zero emissions started with the Bolt EV in 2018. It was the first affordable long range electric vehicle on the market offering a 383 kilometer range and starting just under $43,000 Canadian. This combination of range along with affordability made the Bolt the best selling EV in Canada. And we've just introduced an updated model for 2022. Bringing the Bolt to market taught us a lot about potential barriers to mass adoption of EVs. There's really three main issues that need to be addressed. First, consumers need more choices, vehicles of different sizes and capabilities. Second, EVs need to be affordable enough to compete with conventional internal combustion engine vehicles. We offer that with the Bolt right now. And third, we need to make it easy for people to own and drive an EV. Charging needs to be convenient and fast. And we're working to address all three of these concerns, starting with choice. So think about what you look for in a vehicle. You might want something affordable with room for your family. Your parents might want a more luxurious vehicle. Maybe your neighbor needs enough power to tow their boat to the cottage. The, the takeaway is vehicle owners in Canada need a variety of options. And that's why GM is dramatically increasing EV vehicle options. For families who need more room, for people and cargo, we introduced the all new Bolt EUV. Uh, that's starting to hit our dealerships as we speak. It offers an estimated range of up to 397 kilometers, which is enough to drive from Toronto to Windsor on a single charge. The Bolt EUV is also the first electric vehicle to offer GM's Super Cruise system. This is the industry's first true hands-free driver assistance system. And once you experience Super Cruise, there's really no going back to normal driving. For people who want luxury, we introduced the new Lyric, the Cadillac of EVs. This is the first fully electric vehicle from Cadillac, and it marks Cadillac's shift to an all electric brand by the end of the decade. Every new Cadillac introduced after Lyric will be electric. It starts under 68,000 in Canada, and the Lyric offers more than 480 kilometers of range and a full charge. It also features high-speed DC fast charging that gives customers an estimated 125 kilometers of range in just 10 minutes. The Lyric has all the luxury and technology you really would expect from a Cadillac. For customers who want the ultimate in performance, we introduced the world's first super truck, the GMC Hummer EV. It really demonstrates the extreme performance capability you can get in an EV. With 1,000 horsepower, in watts to freedom mode, the Hummer goes from zero to 100 kilometers an hour in about three seconds. For extreme off-road capability, it has a crab walk feature that allows the Hummer to drive diagonally and extract mode lifts the truck approximately six inches for added ground clearance over obstacles. Performance like this is normally associated with internal combustion engines, not EVs, but that's really the point. Our EVs are designed to offer comparable, if not better performance across our vehicle portfolio and all with zero emissions. So in addition to the Bolt EUV, Lyric and Hummer EV, 
we also confirm that Chevrolet will introduce an all electric Silverado pickup. So as you can see, GM is absolutely committed to making an EV for every person and every need. With the mass adoption of EVs, we often get the question, where can I charge my vehicle? We're tackling this question head on by building public and private partnerships to get communities ready for EVs. And it's important to note that over 90% of charging occurs at home and work. So the first step is making home charging as easy and seamless as plugging in your phone. Recently, Chevrolet announced Charged by Chevrolet. And this program will cover installation of a level two charging outlet for customers who purchase or lease a 2022 Bolt EV or EUV. And it's helping even more people experience how easy it is to live electric. This exciting program allows for customers to have access to faster charging right where they want it at home. We also recently launched the Ultium Charge 360 platform. And that includes a mobile app showing the real-time status of 60,000 charge plugs across the U.S. and Canada. That means GM EV owners can find public charging stations on their route and see which plugs are currently available for them to use. If where can I charge is the most common question about EVs, a close second is what's the environmental impact of EV batteries? GM already reuses or recycles 100% of the batteries returned to us at end of life. And recently, we also announced a new agreement with a Canadian company called Lycycle to recycle scrap materials from our Ultium cells uh, facility in Ohio. We'll recycle up to 70% of the raw materials left over from battery cell manufacturing itself. So as recycled materials are fed back into the market, this should reduce the need for mining raw materials needed for battery production. Now let's shift the focus from regular customers and talk about commercial fleet customers. At GM, our vision for zero emissions is not just limited to retail customers and our dealers. We're also working to apply our expertise and technology to electrify other industries as well. As an example, we recently launched a new business called Bright Drop that will help the commercial delivery business be greener and more efficient. To state the obvious, demand for e-commerce is soaring. I know at our house, it seems that a delivery van is in the driveway every day. So converting delivery vehicles to electric is a huge opportunity to reduce carbon emissions. The World Economic Forum expects e-commerce to grow by 78% by 2030, which would increase carbon emissions from delivery vehicles by more than one third in the world's largest cities. Consumers are ordering more and more online and the pandemic has just accelerated that trend. The first bright drop we'll launch is the EV600. It's an all electric commercial van made to deliver goods and services, and it will be built on the Ultium platform with a targeted range of up to 400 kilometers on a full charge. And I'm proud to say it will be built at our Cami manufacturing plant right in Ingersoll, Ontario. This really marks a milestone. Cami assembly will be Canada's first large scale auto plant converted to produce electric vehicles. And production at CAMI will start well before our competitors who've also announced their own plans to make EVs in Canada. Bright Drop not only eliminates tailpipe emissions from delivery vehicles, it also makes delivery more efficient with the addition of the EP1 electric pallet. Engineers at GM's Canada Technical Center assisted with the development of the prototype for the EP1. Think of it as an electric powered locker that the courier can use to deliver packages to multiple businesses on the same city block. As the visual shows, the EP1 travels behind the courier while he or she is walking to make package delivery more efficient. We conducted a test pilot of the EP1 in Toronto in partnership with FedEx, and the results from this pilot were impressive. Using the EP1, FedEx couriers were able to handle 25% more packages per day. And by reducing the number of trips back and forth to the van, those couriers said the pallets reduced their physical strain as well. So now let's talk about Oshawa. Some of you may be wondering, why are we increasing the production of trucks if we're committed to an electric future? The truth is our trucks are our largest and most important market segment, and they help fund our EV efforts 
and we can sell more than our current footprint could produce. That's why GM Canada invested $1.3 billion into the Oshawa assembly plant. Thanks to the efforts of our Oshawa team, we've accelerated the start of production from an initial plan in 2022 to the fourth quarter of 2021. So as a result, Oshawa Assembly is on track to deliver one of the fastest plant launches in GM history, something we are all very proud of. This is a massive undertaking. Here are some of the numbers to provide a sense of the scale of the investment in Oshawa Assembly. 1,200 new robots are gonna cover 30 acres of automation. There's gonna be an installation of over 3,100 meters of new conveyors. There's 500 kilometers of electrical wiring. A new body shop big enough to occupy the equivalent of 13 acres. Creation of approximately 1,700 jobs and thousands of indirect supplier jobs. We never gave up on Oshawa and we understand that our roots run deep in this community and we're investing in that community. Everyone at GM is proud of the work that we're doing in Oshawa and I think that Colonel Sam McLaughlin would be proud as well. In addition to bringing back full-size truck production to Oshawa, the GM Canadian Technical Center, or CTC, features the all-new McLaughlin Advanced Technology Track located in our Oshawa campus. The track is the first facility in Canada, automotive industry, specifically designed for the testing of advanced vehicle software and technologies. And of course, we named it after the one and only Colonel Sam. His legacy is going to live on as will our history in Oshawa. Our Canadian headquarters is located there and so is one of our Canadian technical centers. The CTC is GM's largest advanced technology center outside the US and we also have a CTC in Markham and another one in campus casing for cold weather testing. Now I'd like to introduce Lauren Dorinspleet. She's the plant communications manager for Oshawa. She has some exciting news for the museum. Hi everyone, my name is Lauren Dornsplate and I'm the communications manager here at the new Oshawa campus. I'm proud to say that I'm a third generation GM employee. Growing up in the Durham region, I saw firsthand how important GM is to our community. And I couldn't be more excited to be part of bringing trucks back to Oshawa. At Oshawa Assembly, we're starting a brand new chapter with truck production beginning in Q4 of this year. As we start this new journey, we're excited to continue our relationship with the Canadian Automotive Museum with a $5,000 donation from our Plant City Grant Program. I can remember touring the museum and learning about how the auto industry pivoted to make armored cars, trucks, and equipment to win World War II. With this donation, we hope the museum will teach future generations about the auto industry in Canada and how we can continue to help communities where we live and work. Thank you for all that you do. My goodness, thank you so much. Oh my gosh, we're so excited to be able to further support the museum, Alex. Um, you guys have an incredible history as well, and uh, it's just a great honor for us to be able to support you. So um, no problem at all. Um, in closing, this really is an historic moment in time for our company, our communities, and the automotive industry as a whole. Momentum is building towards a very bright future for Oshawa and around the world. I'd like to thank you again for the time to get today. And I, I think we've got uh, plenty of time now for, for Q&A, Alex. Thank you once again for, uh, for joining us this evening, Shandor. Uh, Dumerk will take uh, some questions from the, the Q&A here. Uh, if you have any questions, please uh, put them in. Uh, if you have any questions about electric vehicles, uh, about GM Oshawa assembly, we are more than happy to discuss them. Um, so yeah, but, but once again, thank you so much for, for the donation. Uh, we really appreciate that, uh, especially during these uh, uncertain times. Uh, I, I can definitely tell you that we're gonna put that towards a, a brand new display case to show mm. off some of our smaller artifacts. That's something we're really excited about. Um, we have some great historical artifacts uh, and as well, the Oshawa assembly plant has donated some materials from your from the mask making pr process 
uh, and that as a, an important part of our history, uh, very similar to what happened during the Second World War with, with GM switching over to different types of production and uh, really showing uh, a lot of uh, different sides of, of the assembly plant and then the people involved in it as well, which is, which is wonderful. Very cool. Um, so, question. Um, someone's wondering, why did GM stop the production of hybrid cars? And switch over to purely electrics? That's a great question. Um, it really comes down to how do we most quickly get to that future of zero, zero, zero. And um, hybrid cars are, are great, but they really are uh, a, a middle step. They're a compromise solution from ICE to full EVs. And with our investment dollars, we went all in on developing EVs. We want to go to the final best solution uh, with a vehicle portfolio that is true zero emissions uh, versus having uh, a compromised solution. Uh, when you are building just a pure electric vehicle versus a hybrid, which has to have both battery electric and ICE powertrains, it's a bit of a compromised solution. But if you go pure electric, you can optimize that platform for maximum efficiency. Uh, and, and with the investment dollars we've made in the Ultium uh, platform, uh, we think that that is absolutely going to be the winning strategy. Great. Um, another question about uh, sort of wanting more detail on the test track and what happens there and how one might do some test driving on it. Uh, that's a great question too. I, I, I would love to take my car on the test track, but I don't think I'm going to be able to do it. Um, there's going to be a lot of advanced technological training uh, and testing going on at that track. Um, our CTCs are really directly involved uh, in our EV battery technology as well as autonomous driving. So uh, this is going to be a great opportunity for us to have a facility right there in Oshawa uh, connected to our CTC where we can test out the latest GM technologies in EVs as well as autonomous. Uh, and it provides the company just uh, a greater level uh, of engineering ability with the, the test tracks we already have uh, at our facilities in Michigan and elsewhere to have this new test track facility uh, dedicated for, for this high technology testing uh, is, a, is a big win for the company and the development of our, our products in the near future. Uh, okay, uh, up next, uh, someone's wondering how EVs impact the, the vehicle delivery process um, and sort of whether there are, there are extra sort of levels of, of knowledge and understanding needed on the part of, of personnel to be able to, to offer these cars to the general public. Yeah, um, you know, we, we, we're trying to make our, our EV portfolio uh, as mainstream as possible. As, as you saw in the presentation, really an EV for everyone across a variety of vehicles. Uh, and, and our dealers are, are a key uh, in, in helping us to, to deliver those EVs for everyone in the future. Um, they get a high level of training on new product. Uh, they understand the vehicles well. Um, and as they are delivering our EV vehicles, the Bolt EV and EUV, for example, uh, they do review with the customers uh, the things that are different from a normal internal combustion vehicle, right? You're not going to have to gas it up, uh, but there's a, a different way to, to energize the vehicle in terms of charging. Uh, they'll review that. They'll review uh, the app that we have to show consumers where they can find chargers on the charging network. Um, we have a program running right now, so when they get their new Bolt EV or EUV, uh, we will coordinate uh, the install of a level two charger in their home uh, so that they're able to charge their vehicle uh, similar to how they charge their cell phone overnight. Um, we think that is a, a major opportunity for people to get into an EV for the first time. It really takes a lot of the stress out of where am I gonna charge my vehicle uh, and we think that's going to be a key enabler for people being able to take advantage of this technology. And our dealers are at the forefront in helping consumers learn and take advantage of all of that. Uh, I've got a, a question about um, EV performance cars. If there's anything like an EV Corvette or Camaro uh, coming down the pipe. 
That is a great question. Uh, I want to keep my job, so I can't discuss any future product, but we have committed that we are going to have a full EV portfolio uh, by 2035. So I will leave it to everyone's imagination to, to think about what the opportunities could be there. And I'll point to the Hummer EV as an as a, a actual example that we have coming right now. You can certainly say that that's a performance vehicle. When you're talking about a thousand horsepower and zero to a hundred kilometers in about three seconds, uh, that is pretty mind blowing performance for a full size truck. Um, I've got a question from a couple of people that I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of work together. Um, has there been any consultation between sort of GM and um, the utilities uh, planning personnel in Ontario and across Canada? Uh, sort of how how GM's new electric cars will impact sort of electrical utilities bills and things for people, and and how they'll impact the grid directly in Canada? That's a great question. We certainly are working closely uh, with uh, the Canadian federal and provincial governments uh, to ensure that uh, we are moving forward uh, as a country so that we have the infrastructure in terms of power generation, in terms of a charger network, uh, in terms of affordability for consumers and incentives that enable people to get into an EV. It really is a, a holistic approach to the business. You can't just focus on one aspect because they're all interconnected. Uh, so we are working closely with government uh, and private industry to ensure that there is adequate infrastructure to be able to, uh, to, to ensure we can enable these EVs being widely adopted. And I, I think the Bolt EV is probably a great example. It's, it's highly affordable. It's a mainstream vehicle. It's easy and fun to drive. So someone can really transition from an ICE vehicle uh, into an EV. And with this new program, we have to get the charger installed at their home. Uh, it really takes a lot of the stress out of it. Uh, but yes, uh, we are certainly working closely with the government and private industry to ensure that the infrastructure will be in place as EV sales grow. Um, somebody was also asking about um sort of what the, whether you would be able to tell us more or direct people to sort of a, a cradle to grave for a GM electric car, sort of wondering how the, the process of battery recycling works and what their life cycle looks like over use, mm -hmm. because there's obviously a finite time limit on how long you can use these batteries. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I, I briefly hit on the fact that right now it's a small number, but we are taking back 100% and recycling the batteries that are coming in now. Uh, we've established this agreement uh, with Lifecycle, a Canadian company, uh, to enable um, battery recycling. Uh, and we are also uh, establishing uh, an operation where we will utilize um, returned Ultium batteries uh, in, in battery generation infrastructure and facilities that will be able to augment energy needs for plants and private industry. Uh, so we are looking at that holistically, uh, really from a cradle to grave perspective on ensuring it's affordable, cutting edge technology at the time of purchase, that we are recycling as much of the material as possible. And we're also utilizing uh, uh, our infrastructure and expertise to establish opportunities for private business uh, and industry to, to have a, a battery infrastructure to augment their power needs in the future. Um, I've had a couple questions about um, why, why not produce electric trucks in Oshawa? You know, it, it, the, the production we're ramping up right now is critically important. Looking at, at needs immediately, um, there is a huge, huge demand for full-size trucks. And, and that's what we're focused on. And it's a great opportunity to generate jobs and uh, economic growth in Canada. We've committed that we're going to be building um, our, our first trucks, our electric trucks at Factory Zero in Detroit. Um, so don't have anything to discuss beyond that other than the fact that we really are driving towards a future of, of all EVs. Uh, so we're gonna need to have uh, production capacity to, to meet that demand in the future. But right now our focus is on uh, meeting the needs of Canadian consumers today and, and enabling us to be able to have the resources to invest in broadening our electric vehicle 
uh, uh, production in the future, and that will include trucks. On the subject of, of um, sort of transitioning towards a, an all EV fleet, I've had some questions about about sort of um, the the transition from very successful vehicles like, say, the Chevy Volt to this purely EV platform and why that sort of transition happened so abruptly, that shift from uh, high, sort of, we kind of already covered it in the, in the hybrid question, but from, from the Volt hybrid to the, the Bolt. Yeah, um, that's really due to the, the strong vision and leadership uh, of our, our top executives, Mary Barra, Mark Royce and others, uh, where, where we decided that we are going to go all in and, and investing resources to develop a next gen hybrid Volt would have diverted uh, from us developing this cutting edge technology uh, of the Ultium platform. Uh, so we made the decision that we are going to, to focus on the absolute best solution, the end game versus uh, a compromise solution of a hybrid, which just pushes out uh, the, the development and the, uh, the rollout of a full EV um, product portfolio further into the future. We want to we want to do this as quickly and as effectively as possible. Um, and you can see the improvements being made in terms of range and affordability and, and availability of a broad range of products and capabilities. All of that is a direct result uh, of our leadership focusing on going all in on EVs versus the, uh, a diversionary investment strategy uh, of a hybrid vehicle. Um, changing tack completely, uh, somebody's wondering um, if there's going to be a uh, sort of um, whether the, the, the new electric vehicle platforms will be able or sort of purchasable on their own for people to, for instance, retrofit older vehicles with. If somebody wanted to, to retrofit their Camaro with, hmm. with one of these new platforms, if anything like that is, is planned. That is an awesome question. Uh, and, and we actually are developing a solution right now. If you uh, go to the uh, Chevrolet Performance website, uh, we are introducing an EV powertrain system that can be refit into classic vehicles. So um, we had a, uh, a SEMA show vehicle uh, a, a truck that we have developed with an EV powertrain. So you're going to be able to buy turnkey, a battery pack, and the motors so that you can do exactly uh, what this, this uh, participant is asking about, uh, to be able to adapt a, a classic car into an EV powertrain platform. We see that as a, as a, a very viable uh, piece of business in the future. You're seeing more and more uh, customizers looking into this. Uh, the big SEMA show out in Vegas every year, there, there's a greater and greater level of, of builds and interest uh, in EV performance vehicles. Uh, and, and we've even gone so far as to build uh, a, a battery electric Copo Camaro drag car, uh, which is just incredible. And that's helped us to develop the strategy of then making it available for consumers to buy to do exactly what you're talking about. Um, next, I have a couple of Can I jump in with a question, oh. Demerick? Sorry, go ahead. <clears throat> oh. Oh, I, I wanted to jump in with my question about uh, how do we define these as Canadian cars? So obviously, uh, I'm a little uh, biased, but uh, Canadian cars are obviously the best in the world. So, of course. You know, so when we're, you know, my, so future curators a hundred years from now, when they look back at early, um, you know, EVs that are built here in Canada, is there anything that would really define them as being Canadian compared to built in Europe or in Asia or, or in the United States? Um, it's an interesting question, Alex. I, I mean, the, the auto industry of today is certainly a global auto industry, right? In the olden days of Sam McLaughlin, you could point to, his product line of vehicles, you know, a, a McLaughlin Buick was especially built for, designed, and made for Canadians, right? Um, today, it is a global industry. Uh, we, we source components uh, from around the globe. But I think when you look at the commitment that General Motors has made to Canada, Bright Drop being a, a great example, that is a pure 100% Canadian built vehicle. Um, I, I think I think that Canada has a very bright future ahead 
uh, for EVs, um, not only in, in production, uh, but also in the development of these products. Um, we've got our CTCs in place and they are absolutely on the front lines of developing our EV technology and autonomous technology. And, and frankly, Canada provides some great opportunities for product development that you can't get out elsewhere. Capus Casing is a great example, our cold weather testing facility that we established back uh, in World War II for testing military equipment. It is a great place to, to test extremes for vehicles. So uh, all the vehicles we bring to market uh, they take a tour of duty through campus casing uh, and go through torture tests uh, of all of their systems in a variety of extreme cold weather conditions that you can't do in places like Texas. So uh, Canada ha has a bright future ahead in not only production, but also the development uh, of EV vehicles. Uh, a very closely related question about a couple of people wonder sort of what, um, what percentage of the parts of uh, these these electric vehicles will be Canadian made versus uh, American made. I don't have a specific answer for that. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, we have supply bases around the world. We have a lot of suppliers uh, located in Canada for sure. Okay. Let me just click on the list here. Um, um, Going back to the test track, um, what vehicles are going to be tested on the, the Oshawa test track? And um, sort of related to that, for the, this sort of new line of upcoming more autonomous vehicles, what would sort of be the, the major changes a driver would notice in an autonomous versus a non-autonomous non vehicle? Yeah, that's a great question as well. Um, really, um, our, our future EV portfolio, those vehicles are going to be tested at, at, at the McLaughlin test track. Uh, and as we develop further levels of autonomous vehicles, they're going to be tested there as well. We we have the the Super Cruise system right now, uh, the first autonomous system in a GM electric vehicle. It's now available uh, in the Bolt EUV, uh, and it really is incredible to 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 experience. It's it's hard for me to describe, but when you get in the car, there's a there's a bit of a hesitancy at first to to let off, right? Uh, but within five minutes, I found myself trusting the technology because it works so well. I, I would equate it almost to cruise control, but just taken to a, a completely different plane uh, of execution. A and, and it works seamlessly and it gives you plenty of time to adjust. Uh, and, and if it runs into a situation uh, that requires driver input, it gives you ample time and feedback to let you know. As we continue to develop further levels of autonomy, uh, it's just going to take that to, to a higher level that requires less consumer interaction and will provide greater opportunities uh, for, for driverless uh, um, activities. So, for example, right now, Super Cruise works great uh, on, on many highway conditions. As we get into the future, it's going to become more of a matter of, of getting closer to door to door. Uh, where consumers will be able to, to get in their vehicle, in their driveway, punch in their destination, and it's going to be able to take them to their destination, and then uh, the vehicle will be able to park itself. This has great opportunities for not only convenience for people and, and an in increase in productivity, but when you think about older older consumers who, who no longer want to drive or worried about driving, it's a great opportunity. When you think of special needs customers, it provides a whole new world of freedom uh, and, and ability to, to enable people to get out and live their lives. It's very exciting technology uh, and GM is at the forefront of, de of developing it right now. Okay, switching tax again. I've had a couple, um, couple questions about sort of um, lifespan and degree of service and what kind of what kind of a lifespan somebody can expect from say a bolt or, or a contemporary electric car and what uh, sort of degree or reduction or increase in service needed they might expect mm -hmm. you know like any battery whether it's in a, a vehicle or a cell phone or anything there is a degradation of its ability to to hold a full charge uh, over time uh, but when you look at the life cycle of a, a battery electric vehicle it's extremely comparable to the life cycle uh, of an internal combustion engine vehicle. So, uh, you know, the average age of a vehicle on the road right now is about 11 years or so. 
um, that is well within the effective lifespan uh, of, a, of an electric vehicle. Um, and then another question about, um, about charging stations. Somebody's wondering sort of what, um, what kind of home, well, the, the question specifically about the, the amperage required, but just generally what is needed in a, in a home's sort of wiring electrical setup to mm -hmm. be able to host a charging system, uh, station? Yeah, that's a great question. For a home charger, what we call a level two charger, uh, it's really a, a 240 volt system. So imagine your dryer plug, if you have an electric dryer, it's that kind of electrical capacity and it looks like a plug like that. Um, so uh, when you purchase a, a new 2022 Bolt EV or EUV, uh, we've aligned with uh, a, an electric installer uh, that, that handles Canada coast to coast. Uh, they will come out to the consumer's home. They'll conduct an assessment uh, of their electrical system and, and the needs of where you would put the charger for the, the customer. They'll install that. And then with the purchase of, of that Bolt EUV, you get the charger that plugs into that outlet and then, then plugs into the car. So there's no need for a separate freestanding unit. Uh, you get that charger with the, the Bolt EUV purchase. That's an interesting one about sort of given that uh, given that a lot of Oshawa built cars end up sort of driven by people living and working in Oshawa. Um, what are the plans like to given that for a while you're going to have sort of parallel gas and electric production on the same line, in the same factory in the same town? How are there how, sort of what are the plans to, to coordinate or I guess to, to market that? How do you sell electric cars when you're still making gas trucks? A really insightful question. And really, it comes down to it needs to be as easy and as affordable to, to drive and own an EV as it is uh, an internal combustion vehicle. It, it can't be a, 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 a sidebar. It can't be a science experiment. It can't be difficult to understand or use. It has to be a comparable price and it has to be easy to charge and it has to has to be something that they can just get in, press the start button and, and easily understand and drive like the, the, the gasoline powered vehicle they turned in. That's really our objective when we say an EV for everyone. Uh, offering a range of vehicles um, at, a, at a variety of price points and capabilities is key to enable that. Um, making sure that there's uh, a, an easy way for them to charge their vehicles. So the program we're offering uh, is, is an enabler of that. And quite frankly, what we hear from consumers is if it's a level playing field, most consumers, uh, frankly, don't care what is under the hood or what's powering the vehicle. They want something that, that's affordable and meets their needs. So if we can bring uh, electric vehicles to market that do that, and that's exactly what we're doing, that's how we're gonna, gonna transition people into an all electric future. And, and it's happening now. Uh, the, the Bolt EV is a home run for us. Uh, they're selling the instant they hit, hit our dealers. Uh, and, and we're getting many people purchasing those vehicles who have never been in an EV before because it's affordable, it's easy to own, the car looks great, uh, it does what they need to do and it's fun to drive. You'd mentioned the, the trade back program. Somebody's wondering if they trade a conventional vehicle for an EV, are there any chances that its parts might end up recycled into the EVs build? Or is there any cross compatibility between ICs and EVs? Uh, there's really not. Obviously a lot of the systems are, are, are similar, you know, steering systems, brakes, suspension. Um, but no, there's really no cross compatibility uh, between uh, an ICE vehicle uh, and a full electric vehicle. They're dedicated platforms. Um, that Ultium platform, for example, is a, a dedicated platform with the battery pack as a structural element of the floor of the vehicle. Uh, and, and we can configure the motors in a variety of ways, uh, either front, rear, or multiple motors uh, in the rear. Um, so all of that is, is a very specific architecture and, and the body components designed to interact with that Ultium platform are, are very different than what you would see uh, with an internal combustion vehicle. And on a, on a fairly related subject, going back to your previous point about, you know, making EVs accessible for people with disabilities, what kind of allowance and, and how adaptable are these vehicles going to be for, for instance, um, people needing drive on scooters or, or wheelchair access? Um, 
Yeah, we, we offer a, a program now to, to support uh, those with special needs. Uh, as we expand the portfolio uh, of EVs, um, I fully expect that we will absolutely uh, be extending that program into our EV vehicles as well. And then once we get into autonomous, it's just going to be a further enabler to help folks in the special needs community. Uh, I, I'm very close to this. My daughter is special needs, so I, I understand uh, the apprehension and, and and the, the interest that people have in this space. And, and our company ha has a very active group, uh, an employee resource group focused on those uh, with disabilities and special needs. So it is, it is a priority for our company and will continue to be for the future. And uh, I think on a somewhat related tack, um, somebody's asked, will the, the electric vans ever be available for personal sale as opposed to, to purely commercial sale? Right now, the, the Bright Drop vans really are designed to be a commercial product. Uh, they, they aren't designed for retail or, or consumer use. That's not to say we're not going to have um, multi-person capacity EVs in the future. We absolutely will. Uh, but the Bright Drop product specifically, the EV600 van, is designed for commercial use only. Um, I had a question about the, the future of face mask production. Um, is that contract still ongoing? When does that end? Or is it just keep producing masks and they'll get used? No, it's wrapped up. Uh, that was a specific contract uh, for the Canadian government uh, to provide uh, personal protective equipment uh, for, for frontline workers. And, uh, and we fulfilled that obligation. Uh, and we even uh, over over uh, extended a bit on our production, and we provided uh, masks to our dealer network across the country, and they utilize those masks to help their their local communities uh, for for needs for masks. So uh, at this point, that operation is wrapped up. Okay. Um Speaking of expanding and changing operations, somebody's wondering, given the um Given the sort of GM's past history with a, a wide variety of transportation equipment like uh, locomotives, military vehicles, RVs, uh, heavier trucks, is there any plans to, to expand this sort of electric platform into, into those areas? Might we see an electric RV uh, sometime in the future? Yeah, we think there's, there's uh, unprecedented opportunity um, with our battery technology, um, you know, a variety uh, of use cases are being made. Uh, I, I think governments have been interested in, in fleet uh, and military options for, for EV vehicles, and, and we are uh, working with them on some possibilities uh, there uh, globally. And uh, um, in terms of, of locomotives, uh, you know, we, we have talked about in the, in the recent um, past uh, that we are looking at opportunities to leverage Ultium technology uh, to power locomotives as well. Uh, so we think there absolutely is uh, uh, um, great opportunities for leveraging uh, EVs across a variety of uses. Just checking through. Um, so you'd mentioned this, um, this sort of leasing program for used batteries. Somebody's wondering sort of who specifically that would be targeted at and whether that would be aimed at, for instance, um, renewable energy sources or, or sort of green energy in general in the country? Right now, uh, we're looking at opportunities with, with larger manufacturing facilities that have high power requirements. Uh, and there, there's times uh, where, you know, the, the power grid is, is maxed out. There's other times where utilization is lower and you can uh, charge these battery packs in those lower utilization times. And then when there is high utilization uh, periods, these battery packs can then augment the plant's power needs and actually save them money. And it's more environmentally sound because it's not maxing out the capacity of the power plant. Um, going back to our previous question, just briefly, uh, somebody else is wondering about um, the possibility of electric vehicles as say buses, uh, public transit, fire trucks. Uh, just if this, this is, there's any intention to shift this platform towards public sector vehicles. Yeah, we haven't announced anything on that, but certainly uh, in the commercial space, uh, the, the Bright Drop EV600, we think, has huge opportunity. There's massive demand for it. We are getting a, a lot of questions from 
a variety of fleet users uh, on potential opportunities with EVs. Uh, certainly the, the announcement of a uh, uh, electric Silverado uh, is getting a lot of attention, not only in the retail space, but from a variety of, of fleet and commercial customers. Uh, that could include certainly municipalities that use uh, trucks. So I would say stay tuned. And as we further broaden our portfolio, uh, I think there may be a very good chance of that. Uh, somebody would like to know about the sort of, talk a little bit about the sort of internal modifications to the, the plants in Oshawa and the, the campus mm -hmm. in general, but what about sort of external? Are there going to be new buildings going up? Any major changes to the, the landscape as it were, other than the test track, obviously? And so yeah, the test the track's probably the big one. Um, I, I think you're seeing some changes uh, from the outside of, of the plant itself as we ready it for production. Um, certainly we're, we're doing a lot of, uh, polishing and brightening uh, of our facilities in Oshawa. Um, I, the, the one that stands out to me is the, the giant bridge that crosses the street, right? And it's, it's seemingly every media story. Uh, we're gonna be freshening that up with a, a new coat of paint and, and General Motors brand marks. Uh, so uh, I would say a general uh, upgrading across the Oshawa campus is what people will see. Um. Now, I know GM has a long history of sort of on again, off again research in hydrogen propelled vehicles. Somebody's mm. wondering, are there still any projects ongoing for, for instance, hydrogen powered transport trucks or any commercial applications of hydrogen vehicles? That's a great question. Uh, General Motors has uh, invested significantly in developing uh, hydrogen technology. Our hydrotech uh, technology is something that we do see uh, as uh, an important component uh, in the future of, of heavy overroad trucking. Uh, so uh, we are working on that. Um, don't have any specific details at this point, but hydrogen technology is a great technology uh, for, for larger trucks and, and hauling weight. Uh, and we think uh, Ultium technology is more appropriate for consumer retail use with smaller vehicles. Great. Uh, so we just have a couple minutes left here. So if anyone has any final questions, um... hey, I had a, I think I have, I have a, what I thought was a suitable final question. Saved okay. Up. So, um, so Sandor, if given your your love of classic automobiles, if you could retrofit any one GM car from the company's history as an electric for personal use for yourself, what would it be? Oh, that is an awesome question. I would say, um, if I was going to retrofit a classic vehicle. I'm thinking a K5 Blazer would be phenomenal because the massive torque you get from electric motors would enable just a, an awesome level of off-road capability. You see that with the Hummer EV, uh, but to have that combined with the, the vintage greatness uh, of a K5 Blazer would be super cool to me. Works for me. Very <laughs> cool. I know a few people are Googling that right now. Uh, <laughs> not everyone is a car expert, but uh, that's that's the fun of these talks. So I just want to thank you once again, Chandra, for for joining us this evening, uh, taking all of our questions. Um, as you know, we talked about, you know, we're going to just throw out all the questions that that come your way. I know there's been a lot of curiosity, uh, not only about the Oshawa assembly plant, uh, but about electric cars, the pros, the cons. Uh, there's a lot of information out there, a lot of misinformation. So it's uh, wonderful to have a, a frank discussion and, and hear it from you as well uh, during our, our third Thursday talk. Um, I know it would be great if we could all be together in Oshawa, you know, having, you know, uh, cookies and punch afterwards. But uh, here we are in the, the modern world and it's, it's part of our automotive story. Uh, and it's, it's wonderful the amount of work that's been happening down there, given all of the uh, the setbacks uh, that have happened over the last uh, two years since I saw you uh, in, uh, I guess, February 2020, right before uh, the world changed here. So uh, thank you uh, so much. Do you have any final words or any, any final comments uh, you want to say uh, on the topic? Just want to say thank you for allowing us the opportunity to speak with everyone. And on behalf of everyone at, at, at GM Canada, we are so proud uh, of of our Canadian heritage and, and our Canadian industry roots. Uh, and we are diehard uh, supporters for Oshawa and, uh, and, and we just love the history and, and we plan to continue there uh, as long as we can. So, so thank you for the opportunity and uh, congrats on the reopening of the museum. 
thank you very much. And, and, and once again, thank you so much for the donation. Uh, we really appreciate it. And I look forward to showing you all the, uh, the improvements and all the things that are new uh, at uh, the Canadian Automotive Museum. Can't wait. Great. So thanks, everyone, and uh, have a good evening. And we are reopening tomorrow at 10 a.m. So yes. I look forward to seeing you all lined up there uh, outside of the front door.